I'm on the other end. It's getting ready to uh, send it, so. It looks. Um, yeah. yeah, looks good on my end. We're cool. live, yeah. Right on. So, I mean, I'll guess I'll take the second to introduce uh, now Professor Felix Springer. Uh, I was a professor at Old Dominion University and a staff scientist at uh, Jefferson Lab. Uh, he just joined us not so long ago, and he's such a brave soul that he decided to jump into this project and you know teach people from all over the world uh, a little bit about his research. So we're really grateful that he would be doing this, especially as he's transitioning to a new position. So we couldn't be happier. Um, and yeah, take it away. You're in charge, Felix. I'm just going to be in the background, making sure that things don't, you know, catch on catch fire or something. But you're, you're in charge. It's all yours. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Thanks so much for the, for the nice introduction. Um, just, just a quick question. Like, if, if there are questions in the Q and A or so that I don't see, or you just gonna let me know, or? Yeah, I can let you know. Um, okay. Also, some of the students are welcome to turn off, turn on their camera, uh, and speak if they want. You know, we're very nice and casual here, so I'm sure Felix won't be offended if you ask him to stop. But those of you that are on the back end, um, you will need to just put your questions on the Q and A and. We'll pass it on. So, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, anytime, just just speak up. Um, I cannot see, um, you know, if, if someone raises a hand or something because um, I just see my slides. So, um, so just just speak up or or, or let Raul know in some way. Um, all right. So, well, uh, uh, welcome to to the this week's um, Regis uh, Nuclear Mentoring Program. Um, I guess there are two weeks left. So this week um, will be uh, about machine learning and applications uh, in nuclear physics. And next week will be about quantum computing. So two interesting topics uh, left. Um, <clears throat> so of course you guys had lectures already um, for a couple of weeks now, um, but just to make sure we're sort of all on the same page and the focus will be a little bit different than the last weeks. So um, that's why let me start again, um, basically with a very big picture and just to review a couple of things, um, maybe in case you forgot um, some of those, um, and then we'll go into uh, the details. Um, so the main goal of, of nuclear um, and, and particle physics is to understand matter at its most fundamental level. And um, as you've heard in the last weeks, but if you look at smaller and smaller distance scales, um, we find uh, molecules, atoms, and eventually if we find um, the nucleus, uh, which is made up of um, protons and neutrons, um, and then the subatomic particles, or the, sub, um, the, the substructure we can still resolve today um, are quarks and gluons um, that you see here. So we have two up and a down quark um, in the proton, and then we also have the gluons, which are basically the um, force carrier um, of the strong interaction, um, which is described by quantum chromodynamics. Um, and so, of course, you've heard about quarks and gluons in the last weeks. Um, today, we'll also look at some of the other, or at least um, discuss some aspects of some of the other particles in the standard model. Um, so let's take another quick look here, the standard model. So we have these six um, quarks. Um, then we have leptons, so electrons, and the heavier partners, neutrinos. Um, then we have the gluon in, on the side of the interaction, as well as photons, Z bosons, so the electroweak sector. And we also have the Higgs particle. And so that will actually be one of the motivations of the machine learning application um, that I'll discuss today. Um, so the Higgs particle, of course, we, we've, we've known about it now. Um, it's been proposed um, you know, a long time ago, but we know about it since 2012. Um, but we still know relatively little about it and about its interaction um, with um, uh, the standard model itself interaction. Uh, and also um, it's a very promising way to search for physics beyond the standard model. So the more we know about the Higgs, the, the, the better. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the way to access um, these very um, small distance scales, um, they're way smaller than you know, things that we can sort of observe with our eyes, of course, um, is through high energy collider experiments. Um, you can see here three examples. Um, there's the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN, um, in, in Switzerland, which is the highest energy collider that we have. 
Uh, and so um, some of the applications that I'll talk about today uh, will be specifically related to this. Um, but there are, of course, also experiments here in the US currently, um, um, where, uh, for example, at Jefferson Lab, we have uh, um, experiments and detectors that, looks, that look like this. They're at low energies, but they have very high, uh, uh, high luminosity, so very intense beams. And so if they can answer different questions um, than the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and also in the future, we'll have um, a new collider, the Electron Ion Collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory, um, which is sort of in between in terms of energy uh, and can also um, uh, basically answer some, some specific questions um, that cannot be answered with the current machines that, that we have. Um, so to visualize this a little bit, um, what you can see here um, is uh, the tunnel um, of the Large Hadron Collider. You see here in, in blue, uh, the, the beam line where we accelerate particles to extremely high energies and then we bring them to collisions. So these protons rotate in, in opposite um, uh, directions and then we bring them to collisions. And so these collisions are then recorded um, with uh, these experiments. This is um, the Atlas experiment um, at CERN at the, at the LHC. And so um, there's uh, a video to illustrate this a little bit. You can see here again, the tunnel with the blue um, beam pipe. And so we accelerate particles and all right, starting the video. So you see here um, the proton in um, the beam pipe with the three quarks uh, that we just saw. And so um, they're accelerated to high energies and they're brought to collisions um, with a proton that's coming in here from the left um, in, in the opposite direction. And so they collide. <clears throat> and what happens in these collisions is um, that we basically produce a lot of energy and that energy can uh, in, can produce events uh, like the one um, that are, is shown here, where you have a lot of particles um, that are being produced and they basically are then detected um, by the Atlas experiment um, uh, that, that, that is shown here. And um, basically different parts of the detector light up and they measure uh, the energy um, of the particles um, that are being produced. So in general, we cannot uh, observe these quarks and gluons um, directly. The same applies to say the Higgs boson, right? If you wanna measure properties of the Higgs, it's so short-lived that we cannot actually detect it. Um, so with all the this big detector, right? It's, it's too far away basically from these very, very small distance scales. Uh, the distance scale is something like 10 to the minus 20 meters. Um, and that's just not something that we can observe uh, with any detector uh, uh, today. So what we can do instead though, is we can see basically these um, sprays of particles. So right, the, the distribution of particles here um, is not like symmetric in the final state, but it basically points in very specific um, directions. Um, so what you can see here, that's kind of a cone now drawn around it um, at the end, right? And there's a similar one here um, sort of pointing downward. Um, and as it turns out, these sprays of particles are um, very good signatures um, of the underlying quark and gluon degrees of freedom. So in the hard collisions, so basically at the center here, um, we have um, a scattering uh, process that happens in terms of quarks and gluons, right? When these protons collide, um, and then they produce highly energetic quarks and gluons. And so we don't see them directly, but what we do see is basically their decay products. So they're um, basically, um, which is what I'm trying to show here, um, you produce a quark, um, in sort of this direction of the jet, or in this case, uh, a gluon, um, right, the, the way we only think of like Feynman diagrams. And then um, we don't see them directly, but we see basically all the particles that are produced in the shower cascade. Um, and so by studying these sprays of particles or jets, um, where a lot of energy is um, uh, deposited in the detector is very localized, um, that gives us a handle to actually um, get some access and some understanding, a very direct understanding um, of these quarks uh, and gluons. Um, so to first uh, approximation, we can think of every jet as, um, as being basically a proxy of the quarks and gluons that we want to study. And basically the Higgs gives the exact same um, uh, signal in, in the detector um, as these quarks and gluons, that they just look slightly different. And so that's basically one of the goals, right? We get basically all this data coming out from the LHC. It produces an incredible amount of data. It's more, even more data than we can record. A lot of the data that, is, that could be produced is not even recorded because it's so much. 
Um, and so that's of course very natural then to think about whether machine learning can help us to sift through all the data and find the interesting signals um, that, that we want to see and that we want to keep. And so um, the uh, machine learning application that I'll talk about today is specifically related to jets and it's trying to understand um, the jets that we see here, do they come, for example, from a gluon or do they come from a quark um, or do they come, say, from a Higgs particle, right? That would be basically the most interesting things um, that we want to study. Um, and so we basically want to be able to look at these jets and try to disentangle um, which jets um, come from which subatomic particle. And that basically gives this window to these quantum processes that are essentially too short-lived to actually see them directly uh, in an experiment. So we have to basically look at the indirect um, signals uh, of them. And so jets are basically a tool uh, to do that. Now, to give a little bit um, more uh, motivation of what, where sort of jets come from. Um, so we have, again, our proton-proton collision here, um, say at the LHC or at some of the US experiments um, where they collide at very high energies. And then something else happens on this side because we have to have momentum conservation. And then we produce here a highly energetic um, gluon or up quark or a down quark or any other particle. And then there are some interactions. So we start out, say, in this particular case with a quark, but then it emits um, an additional gluon. And so it basically can not just emit one, but it can emit several. And then we sort of get a broadening of the distribution, right? So we don't just have, like initially just have one quark, but then it will produce several uh, at a later stage. Um, and it not only produces more quarks and gluons um, during this parton shower, this parton cascade, um, but eventually, um, of course, all these things are gonna turn into hadrons, right? So like pions and kaons, protons, neutrons, these are all hadrons. And so we have a transition basically from quarks and gluons to hadrons. Um, so hadrons is something that you've heard about in the last weeks, right? When, um, uh, when, when Raul and, and others discussed a lattice QCD, right? That's basically a way to compute their masses. Um, so in that context, you have heard of that. Um, here, we basically find that um, there's a lot of these hadrons that are being produced. Um, a lot of those are basically um, almost collinear relative to the initial direction, and they basically make up the jet. And so here, we're kind of asking a very different question, right? We're not primarily interested in um, you know, measuring the masses of hadrons, right? You would do that in a sort of a different way. Here, we basically take them as a proxy of the underlying quark and gluon degrees of freedom that were produced in these collisions. Um, but of course, um, the jet, so the, the high energy object, sort of as the, the whole object here, that's of course made up of these, these elementary um, hadrons um, or of these, of these composite objects where, um, where that are color neutral, um, made up of quarks and gluons. And so then of course we want to detect that, right? So here is say our um, detector that you saw before and we can measure uh, the energy, we can maybe measure the electric charge of these particles. Um, and we measure their direction. And so by then looking, this is the only thing that we can observe. So we have to um, look at this and we try to reconstruct what actually happened here in these collisions. Was this, for example, a gluon, right? Then we get a jet that looks in a particular way. Was it a quark, an up quark? It will look in a particular way. Or was it a Higgs particle? And it will also look a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> and of course, on the theory side, even though I'm not gonna talk much about theory side, but at least let me mention, um, that from the QCD perspective, um, of course, the goal is then to measure different um, aspects of this and ideally measure quantities of these jets um, that we can compute from first principles in, in QCD. Um, so for example, what we can measure is the total energy of these jets. So we, we find a jet in the detector and then we measure how energetic is that jet, or we can measure how, what is the mass of the jet. So we can try to weight the jet. Um, the mass is actually particularly important because that um, changes significantly. So for example, if I have a jet that's produced by a quark or a gluon, that will have a, on average a very different mass than a jet produced by a Higgs particle, um, just because the Higgs itself is uh, already a massive object. And so looking at things like the mass, right, we want to know the mass of the Higgs and constrain it further by right? looking, for example, at the mass um, of a jet is a, is a very uh, important uh, uh, measurement, right? And, and these are things that we can actually compute um, from, from a theory side. <clears throat> so um, to say a few more words about this, why, why um, you know, I keep talking about jets. First, um, they basically allow us um, to study all kinds of interesting aspects in quantum field theory. So um, in particular in QCD that you heard about in, in the last weeks, 
And these jets can look differently, right? So for example, I mentioned um, a jet that comes out from uh, an underlying quark or a gluon that can look something like this, right? So you see a cone here uh, drawn around, you know, the dominant flow of energy. And then there's a lot of momentum or, or energy deposited right at the center of that jet. And so that gives us an indication that probably that jet um, originated from a quark or a gluon. Um, if, and you know, that's why I keep talking about the Higgs particle, if we have say Higgs um, that produced the jet here on the left, um, then that can look very different. So for example, here you see at the center, there's not all that much energy at all, but there's a lot of energy um, deposited in the detector cells on the, you know, basically up and just below and above the center. So you have what is called like a two prong structure. There's two hot spots of energy in, in that jet versus here we only have one of them. And so that gives us an indication that, you know, probably or potentially that jet um, came um, from Higgs particle as opposed to, to a quark and a gluon. And so one of the goals is basically to disentangle those, where right? we want to have a, a, a way of um, saying, well, uh, it's more likely that the jet on the right came from a QCD particle versus the jet on the left came from, from you know, a Higgs that was produced here at the center of the, of the collision. So that's one way um, that we want to learn more about um, the standard model of particle physics and, and jets allow us to do that. Um, also, if we want to search for extensions um, beyond the standard model of particle physics, so if we're interested, say, in dark matter production, uh, if we're interested in supersymmetric theories and so on, then um, also that basically allows us um, to constrain a lot of these um, possible extensions of physics beyond the standard model um, uh, using jets of these, you know, these highly energetic objects. Um, there's another uh, um, context in, in, in which um, that is jets are relevant. Um, that is very much or that the next two points are much more sort of the nuclear side. Um, one of them is that we want to go to heavy ion collisions um, <clears throat> um, where we can uh, create a so called core gluon plasma um, that is shown over here. Um, I think this appeared also somewhere in earlier lectures where you basically not look at um, uh, hadrons uh, in vacuum but you, you have so many of them um, that you basically generate a finite density or a finite temperature. And so in this case, you can um, go into a region of phase space where these quarks and gluons move freely and they're not um, confined in these kind of um, uh, nuclei that you see here in protons and neutrons, pions and so on. Right? Normally they have to be confined, right? um, but in some cases, if we're at sufficiently high temperature, they can be deconfined. Um, in, and they're not bound in these, in these hadronic states. And so that's a very interesting um, state of matter that's actually connected to cosmology. Uh, so we expect that very shortly after the, the Big Bang, uh, the universe um, went through that um, phase of the core gluon plasma and then eventually you know, continued to cool down and expand. And then eventually things became uh, uh, into you know, a low temperature and um, it became everything um, turned into hadrons basically. So that's also something that we can study um, in uh, heavy ion collisions at RIC um, or uh, at Brookhaven or at the Large Hadron Collider. And so jets also here um, allow us to do that. And also in this case, of course, we want to know was that a quark or a gluon jet uh, that basically propagates um, through this, this medium. Um, and there are, of course, other questions. Um, for example, um, we know that the proton spin is one half. Um, uh, that is something that will be relevant for this future experiment that we will be built at Brookhaven, the electron ion collider. Um, but it's not quite clear really how that spin one half emerges um, from the underlying degrees of freedom. So how the quarks and gluons that are shown here, you know, within the proton, um, how they sort of behave all together um, uh, to generate this um, proton spin of one half. So that's also uh, an important question that we would like to understand better. Um, and also here, um, jets and the things I'll talk about uh, play an important role. Now, to make this a little bit more concrete um, or to motivate the machine learning problem um, that I'll talk about today, um, let's think again about the, the Higgs um, particle. So as I mentioned, um, the Higgs particle, um, we cannot observe it directly, right? It's, it's very short lived and it will decay before it reaches the detector, far before it reaches the, det the detector. And so what happens is that it decays into all kinds of different um, particles. Um, and then we can try to detect those or also their decay products. Um, so for example, which you can see in this um, pie chart here, 
it decays, 60% of the Higgs particle will decay just to quarks, right? So that's the QCD particles we, we, we know very well now. 9% will go to gluons and it will produce a bunch of other things too. So for example, it will produce W bosons, tau, Z bosons, and photons. So it produces a lot of other particles. Um, but of course, also the quarks and gluons, we know we cannot see them directly, right? Th these are already indirect um, uh, indications, right? That there was a Higgs in the hard uh, uh, scattering process. Um, but also those particles here shown in this pie chart, we of course cannot directly see them as well, right? So what we do see instead are jets, right? We know that quarks and gluons will produce jets. So actually, so what is shown here in green is all um, uh, uh, jets, or like the, the experimental signature in uh, the detector will be just a jet, right? Um, and also these other things here, like the W boson and so on, actually all of those will pretty much all decay to jets. So actually 98% uh, percent of um, Higgs particles that are produced, all of them will leave as a, uh, as a signature and the detector will just leave a signature of a jet. And only 2% are electromagnetic um, uh, signals. So for example, electrons and muons or photons, um, th those are not jets. So basically 2% are things that we can measure without jets and pretty much everything else. Um, the only signature that we get in the end in the experiment is going to be a jet. And um, interestingly, these 2% were actually used uh, to discover the Higgs, right? So in 2012, when the discovery of the Higgs was announced, we basically just made use of this 2% of the total production rate of the Higgs particle. But 98% um, were not used and are still um, very difficult to use in practice. Um, and so if you want to learn more about the Higgs, right, about its self-coupling and about potentially physics beyond the standard model, then of course it would be great if we can make use of this 98% of the total production rate um, of, of the Higgs. And so of course, to do that, um, we need to understand jets better. Um, and, and by understanding them better, we can then potentially make use of, of you know, the dominant uh, experimental signature of, of these particles. And that's just, you know, experimentally, that's just what we have to deal with. Um, and just to illustrate a little bit more um, how this can happen. Um, so we have say a Higgs that is produced and sort of this comes as an additional complication. So if the Higgs is produced in these collisions and it basically just sits there, it's basically produced at rest, then it will decay. And because momentum conservation, it will produce two jets that are basically go in opposite directions. Okay, so we have say a Higgs that sits here um, in the detector uh, sorry, in the, in the collision at the very center, and then we'll produce two jets that are pretty much um, back to back. Um, but if the Higgs doesn't just sit there, but it itself has a large momentum already, then what can happen is that these two jets that would normally be produced, they actually merge into a single jet. And so, um, for example, if, you know, sort of goes in this direction um, from left to right, uh, as it has more energy already, then eventually all the decay products of that Higgs particle are gonna be merged into a single jet. And so um, that's basically an additional complication, right? The signatures of the Higgs can be very different. Um, they can be uh, like two jets or they can be merged into a single jet. And so we have to then basically compare that jet to say a QCD jet like that originated from a quark and gluon and we have to be able to differentiate these two things. And so that's what we'll try um, to do with uh, machine running. Now, before coming to machine learning, let me make a little bit of a connection um, to uh, what you've heard about in the last weeks. Um, so of course, the overarching theory in terms of QCD or the standard model is um, quantum chromodynamics. You've seen, um, I think, uh, this, this Lagrangian before. Um, what it just means is that we have quarks and gluon fields. So we have these kind of interaction vertices, these Feynman diagrams. Um, so quarks coupling to a gluon, or they have um, the gluon self-coupling uh, shown here. And so um, that leads um, to this, this very important diagram in QCD, um, which is <clears throat> sort of a kind of a defining aspect of, of QCD, which is that the, the strength of how strongly quarks and gluons couple to each other, so how strongly they interact, um, that actually decreases as we go to higher and higher energies. And so this is typically written here in terms of alpha S, which is just a coupling constant squared up to some normalization factor. And you can see that this coupling constant goes down as we go to higher energies. Um, note that these are um, uh, several orders in magnitude here um, that are shown. Um, and so what we'll be discussing today is really in that very high energy region, right? The Higgs mass is somewhere around here. The jets 
the jet energy can actually be several thousand um, um, GeV. So this is the units here in GeV. So it can actually be somewhere in that region over here, right? So the, the things that we'll look at and the things that the, the observable, um, the signatures that we see in the detector, say at the Large Hadron Collider, they're in this region that's called asymptotic freedom, where the quark and gluon interaction um, is relatively weak. Okay, and so what that allows us to do, even though I'm not going to discuss this much further, is that we can actually do perturbative calculations. Um, so that means if we're interested in the cross section, or say if we're interested in the production rate of a particular process, say QCD jets, then um, we can write down a perturbative power expansion in uh, the strong coupling constant of S. So you see, this is the most important term here, sigma zero, and then this one is down. Say if this is you know, 10%, 0.1, then this will be a 10% correction, this will be a 1% correction, and then we don't really need these additional terms here anymore, and that would give us a very good approximation, and we can compare theory and experiment. So we're in this region of very, very high energies. And so what you heard about in uh, last week's is sort of the opposite end of that, right? So if we're in this region here, where if you're around one GeV, that's kind of the hadronic scale, right? That's the mass of the proton and things like that. It's like around one GeV. Then this approach will not work. Um, instead, what you have to do is you need to use lattice QCD. And that's exactly what you heard about in the last weeks, right? Where you discretize uh, your field theory on a spatial lattice, or you also discretize time. Um, and then you can compute things like hadron masses, right? So that's something that doesn't work in perturbative QCD. But for everything that I'll talk about today, we're basically in this region, right? Where we have some relatively good theoretical control and we can use, you know, perturbative um, techniques. Um, and so today I'll really just talk about machine learning in that context. Um, and depending on how far I'm going to get, I'll also um, say a few words on uh, uh, Thursday um, on machine learning applications in the context of lattice QCD. Um, there are also important applications there as well. Um, and um, so I'll um, try to cover some of those things on, on, on Thursday, um, but I'm not gonna go into that much detail, um, but I'll try to provide um, references. Uh, if, if you're interested in those topics, you can, can read more about that sort of at a very introductory level. Okay, so this is mostly to make a connection of you know, how this fits in, uh, compared to previous weeks, it's sort of the opposite end of the, of the energy spectrum. All right, now let's switch a little bit to machine running. Um, of course, we've heard a lot about AI and, and machine running um, and that it has a wide range of applications. Um, in particular, in sort of the last decade, a lot of um, application or people came up with a lot of applications um, in part because of important progress that, that was made um, and also um, just that we have much better computers now um, that are actually allow us to do um, these type of calculations. And so um, just to give a few examples, right, we have, um, for, we're able to train um, uh, machine learning uh, on to as a, like basically a player and to play Go, it's used in robotics. It's, uh, we hope um, that we can use it eventually um, for, uh, for self-driving cars um, and sort of a very, relatively simple application compared to these is, is that we can do image recognition, but that's essentially what a lot of these things are based on, um, right? That we can compare, for example, these two images and we, we see that there's a cat, whereas here's a dog, or there's a bunch of other animals here. And we couldn't put, you know, these kind of bounding boxes uh, around that in, in this image. This is often done with convolutional neural networks that I'll talk about um, today. Um, but that's also really what goes into these kind of applications, right? If you look about look at um, self-driving cars, right, then you need to be able to identify certain aspects, um, uh, and you know you need to place them somewhere in in the three-dimensional space. So um, a lot of these things uh, have a lot of overlap, um, and really a lot of that goes back to what you see here. That's a, an example of a neural network um, that really allowed um, that we can now really train efficiently, and that really allowed us um, to. Uh, study all these different applications. And <clears throat> so the, the question um, that I uh, want to address today is how we can use uh, machine learning to understand these types of collisions that, that you see an example here, right? You see all these jets coming out here in the detector. Um, can we make use of machine learning to analyze the data? As I mentioned, right, there's a lot of data that is being produced. So it's very natural, um, a very natural application uh, to use machine learning for that. Um, to give a little bit of an overview, people like to show this, uh, this uh, uh, image here um, where um, that shows kind of different branches or different aspects. 
uh, of machine learning. Um, here it's basically shown in terms of three categories. We have um, supervised learning. So that's basically what we'll talk about today. Uh, and in particular, we'll talk about an example of classification. So that would be in this category. Um, and that's also, of course, very natural to think about, right? So if we have, say, all these different jets that are being produced um, at the LHC, right, we want to know, did that actually come from a Higgs particle? Did it come from a quark? Or did it come from a gluon, right? That's basically what we have to do to make use of all the data. So that's basically a classification problem. And so that's what I'll talk about today. Um, but there's, of course, a, whole, a lot of other um, uh, applications as well in the context of regression, unsupervised running. And so here's a, my a short version of this, um, uh, specifically about applications in nuclear uh, high energy physics. So today we'll talk about classification, um, but there are a lot of other applications such as generative modeling, anomaly detection, regression, and things like that. And so I'll cover, try to cover some of these um, uh, uh, tomorrow, but with that, uh, not tomorrow, Thursday, uh, but without going into um, too much detail. All right, um, so that was basically my introduction. Um, are there any, any questions until now? And then um, we'll go through first machine learning and neural networks, and then we'll basically go back to uh, uh, problems in nuclear physics and specifically jet classification. Um, but, but let me know if there are any questions until now. I don't see any questions in the chat, but let me, maybe it's a good time to remind people that if you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate. Either put them on the Q&A box or raise your hand. Don't just unmute yourself. Also, you're welcome to tell us how you're doing, giving a feedback. Right, right. But it seems right. like... Seems like you can keep going or, oh. Yeah, I no, I was gonna say, I just, yeah, everything's been clear so far. Um, All right. I think I think it's been great. Okay, great, great. All right, thanks. Then let me start by going through um, in quite some detail um, of how neural networks work and how we can, how we can train them. So here, I'll, I decided to really only cover neural networks in detail. Right? I'm of course, aware that machine learning is not just neural networks. But it is um, what will be relevant for the for the topics I discuss, and it's also really what has been really a driving force over the, over the last ten years that we can now efficiently make use of of neural networks. All right. So what's can a neural network? Oh, yes. Sorry, you did have a question now in the Q and A box asking okay. um, for any good textbooks machine learning. Maybe you will touch on that at some point, or you can put it afterwards. It's up to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I definitely have a link to, to one or two good, good textbooks where there are PDF files available. Uh, and also um, they're linked to you know, a bunch of Jupyter notebooks that you can just go through by yourself. Uh, I don't have them in uh, my slides today. Uh, I can either um, send those on Slack uh, later on, um, uh, just the two links, or I can include those um, on, in, in my presentation also on Thursday. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely have two, um, which I think are very good uh, introductions to, to machine learning that, that could be useful. So that's a, that's very good. good. Maybe it'd be good to either way, but at least put them on the slides so that when you share them with people, they can see that after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. And there is another question saying, maybe this is kind of the point of what you're gonna talk about, <laughs> but. <it's, laughs> How can developing this machine learning be done on the physics side of the effort now? It seems like a decent amount uh, would have to be done on the computer science side first. So I guess the question is more, are, how are physicists, I mean, maybe more abstractly, how will you describe machine learning being done on the physics, physics side? So are physicists mostly being users or are they developing new algorithms or both? Right, I, I would say it's definitely both. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, you know, if you think about the last 10 years, right, like this, this sort of revolution in, in, you know, being able to efficiently train neural networks that certainly came from computer science. And so then, you know, the first steps, right, that I'll also mention here in the second part, 
were done exactly by you know taking something just off the shelf right and trying to apply it to, to just classification right? um, and that worked to some extent um, it actually outperformed significantly things that you know me and other theorists have come up with uh, um, in sort of um, you know the field sort of came up with over the last decades um, and so it's just things you know out of the box turned out to work quite well um, but since then and I think sort of the first papers came out in you know 2015 um, so since then a lot of progress has been made because the the data that we get out from the LHC is still very different um, compared to things um, that are needed um, you know in, in these applications um, here for example right so so one thing I'll, I'll talk about a little bit is that here, right, like all the pixels are basically filled in, right? All of them have some color, right, and, and so on. Versus here, you see this is much more sparse, right? There are a lot of areas in the detector um, that are just empty, right? And so that is sort of one of the things, right, where people improved um, significantly. And so um, by the first try is um, to use, has been to use convolutional neural networks that right, work very well um, for like image recognition, um, but they turned out to have, sometimes they have some issues. Uh, with this very sparse data. And so some then, you know, like also physicists came up with, um, you know, more efficient ways of, of doing that and sort of um, also, you know, coming up with new um, uh, network architectures, machine learning architectures. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's not just, you know, as a user, but it's definitely one has to, um, you know, develop new things to, to make use of, of these tools uh, and to make, um, to make them very efficient for the problems that we are, we're actually interested in. So it's not, you know, just one-to-one -one, uh, and just applying that. Uh, but historically, of course, you know, that um, the computer science, of course, had the main impact on, on, on physics in that uh, direction. Yeah, great. I see that one of our students has their hand raised. Rohan, do you want to, uh, do you want to type the question that you have or maybe, did you sign the pho the photo release form? Maybe I should start with that because if you did, then we can allow you to speak. Mm -hmm. Maybe while you answer that, um, maybe okay. Let's see what they said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Why don't we take a leap of faith and allow you to talk? And then we'll fact check this. Hi, uh, Rohan. Hello. I know it's super off topic and I'm not able to keep up with the program for a few weeks. I want to ask a question that uh, the, ever the presentation part, can we make uh, the topic ourselves? Like it should be related to nuclear physics, but uh, can we make the topic um, by our will? Okay, so you're asking not about the content now, but you're asking about the no, presentation sir, that you're supposed to give. I've been able to like, be, I mean, like in different country right now, so I'm not able to um, connect with the uh, program uh, so properly. So I'm like, in really, uh, I was uh, okay. not able to ask this question. So I asked today. Sounds good. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so first, do you have access to the Slack chat? Because these are, you know, th these kinds of questions are really great. And a lot of people have been asking me these questions. So I've been asking everybody yeah, to put those questions. Yeah, I have the access. Okay, good. Um, so I'll answer it here, but you're welcome to ask that question in the general chat there, because I'm sure other people will have these questions. And you can imagine that if we have dozens of people asking the same questions separately, I will never do anything with my life but answer questions. Uh, and I kind of like to have a life beyond that. But um, yeah, so the, the the role of the presentations for the for the mentoring program is for you to practice talking about something that you've learned. And so ideally it 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 would be contained in the types of topics that we've covered, but you can you can uh, if you're brave uh, and you know we you know we applaud bravery so if you want to be brave and and go a little bit further then by all means give it a shot um but you're supposed to this is why you're supposed to give a title and a, and a and an abstract so a short summary by the end of this week so we can check it make sure it makes sense and then if it doesn't make sense we'll give you feedback okay but it, it should be nuclear so we have to make physics some or particle physics 
What's that? Type the title and abstract by ourselves and write and give, submit to you before this week. That's right. Did you get a link for a Google form where you can submit Yeah, I, that? I have to fill it before I was typed. Yeah, and, and you're able to access it and you can type, right? It works. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Great. Yep, no problem. Yeah, give that a shot. Uh, and if there's anything that remains confusing, I would encourage you and others to ask that question on the Slack chat so that others can see it and we can, you know, everybody sees the same content and the answers are the same across the board. Sure. All right, awesome. All right, so All right. back to the regularly scheduled program. Uh, Felix, you want to take it away? All right. All right, thanks. Um, all right, let me continue then uh, with um, discussing some details of, of neural networks. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let me start with what is, what is a neural network and then how we can uh, train it and, and, and make use of it. So what you can see here is an example um, of a neural network um, that basically consists of um, a set of neurons that are shown here uh, as circles. So we have here uh, a, a input layer um, of neurons there in that particular case, there are 784 of those that are basically the input layer. Um, and then they're connected to what are called hidden layers. So there are two hidden layers um, of neurons. Um, and in this particular case, there's like an all to all connection. So this neuron is connected to all the neurons on uh, the second layer, the first hidden layer. Um, and so that basically gives us a way um, to compute the neural network, which is um, basically just a function that maps uh, an input vector um, to some output vector. And so in this particular case, it's taking as input um, these images here, that's like an image um, of a hand-drawn uh, number. Uh, here's a seven. And then you pass that through a neural, neural network. And then that's, in this case, used to do a classification task. So it's supposed to give us uh, uh, the answer that that's actually a seven. And so that's encoded here um, in these um, output neurons. There's 10 of them. So it can um, basically give us the number zero to nine. Um, and so ideally, what the network sh should do, if it's perfectly trained, it should give us a one, like this neuron, this activation or the, the value of this neuron here should be one and everything else should be zero. Then we would have a perfect answer for this, right? Um, of course, it's not gonna be exactly like that, but that's what we would like to approximate, right? So the label in this case, if we consider this to be supervised learning, I'll get back to that a little bit, um, it would be, this is the input and we know the label for that is a seven. So ideally this, the result of this network after training uh, should be that it gives us an output seven in this particular case. And so uh, to really understand the structure, uh, like here it looks a little bit complicated, but it's basically built out of very fundamental and very simple building blocks. And so let's take a look at um, one of these building blocks basically trying to make it as simple as we possibly can. So let's just take a neural network that's with just a single neuron. And so that's um, what is shown here. So um, that's generally referred to as a feed forward a uh, neural network, right? Because we have these um, uh, arrows that, you know, point uh, forward to, to the neurons. Um, and so we here we have, as I mentioned, like the simplest uh, uh, neural network, which just consists of one neuron. Um, and, but then if we go um, from there to more complicated cases, it's really just stacking those, right? We add more and more neurons that will give us a very complicated function, but the individual units, the neurons themselves are relatively simple. So what is shown here um, is the one neuron, um, which is labeled as N1. And it takes as input these three parameters, Xi1, Xi2, and Xi3. And so that's basically, say, like the data, right? That's similar to you know, this image of a seven, um, <clears throat> uh, which you, uh, you know, would turn into a vector, right? Um, uh, where you um, have so instead of having, say, a matrix, but you turn it into a vector, and each entry in that vector will be the intensity um, of the pixel, um, and that's how we uh, discretize that, that image. And so that's, say, the input here. So we have three inputs, and then we want to compute the value here of that neuron N1. And so the way we do that is shown here on the right. So we want to know the value N1, and it depends on the input vector. So we have here, that's written in bold, 
uh, this vector xi that just contains the values. These are just you know, some values, xi one, two, and three. And then it will depend on parameters. And these are basically parameters that eventually we want to determine to make the neural network do a task that, that we're interested in. Um, so in this case, there are four parameters of that one neuron, the way it's parameterized. And so there's these wi, one i, one just says, because that's one neuron and um, these are weights. And we have a biased uh, term as well, which is here theta one. And so the way we now compute the value of the neuron is shown here on the right. Uh, let's first forget about this um, function phi. Let's just look at what's shown here inside the bracket. Um, and so the way we compute the value of that neuron is that we take the input values, psi i, we weight it by these weight factors, w1 i. Um, that's why these are weights. They weight the input um, in a multiplicative way. And then we just sum over i. So we, in this case, we sum over i going from one to three. So that basically means we take the input, we multiply it by the weights, and we sum over the result uh, for over all the input, uh, over all the entire input vector. So in this case, just three. And then in addition to that, we have a uh, um, an additive term, which is written here as theta one, and that's called a bias term. So this entire neuron has four parameters. Um, it has three, oops, that was one too fast. Um, three weights and um, one additional bias term. Right? That's the parameters of, of, this, of this one neuron, of this very, very small uh, neural network. And so then there's still this additional function here, that's an activation function. So note that this, what, I, what you see here in brackets is like a linear map, right? Like we multiply something and then we add uh, you know, a, a term as well, right? So that's very, it's, it's like a linear transformation. And so it can be shown that that's not enough. That's not general enough. We cannot just construct a neural network out of uh, linear maps. But what we need is an activation function that basically tells us when the neuron should fire. That's sort of the connection um, uh, you know, to, to, um, to neurons that we have in biology, right? Where we have this, uh, it has to be a nonlinear, has to be a nonlinear activation function. Only then the neural network, if we basically then put together enough neurons will be general enough to approximate pretty much any function that, that we want. And so these activation functions um, are shown here or some of the possible activation functions that we can choose from are here. The only requirement is that um, there essentially have to be some, some nonlinear function to really uh, work. Um, and there's also more than that, um, but um, what you can see here in, in, in this uh, figure are nine examples um, of activation functions that we can choose from. Um, and so let's just take a look at one example um, here, the one in the upper uh, left corner, that's the ReLU function or rectified linear unit. Um, what it does is it returns a zero whenever um, the, uh, uh, this, this um, uh, function here um, in that, you know, or the value where we evaluate it is negative, right? Then it will just return a zero and it will return um, just the value, um, it's, this is linear here, it will just return the value itself whenever the term here in brackets is positive, right? So it's basically setting it to zero when it's negative and it just returns the value uh, whenever uh, it's a positive value, okay? So that's a, pos that's a possible um, activation function. Um, that generally turns out to be a very good activation function. Um, that's basically something one has to then uh, uh, try and choose whatever works for the application that you're interested in. Uh, in some cases, for example, you want to use a 10H function um, that, that looks like this, which has this kind of sigmoid behavior, right? Um, that um, it also, you know, returns uh, a finite value whenever, um, you know, the, the, the input here is, is negative um, and it's bounded um, between, you know, uh, that has an upper and a lower bound. So sometimes that works very well. Um, so it kind of depends on, on, on what, um, what, what works for the particular application. And the other relevant question to choose an activation function. Uh, so it depends on the application, also depends on uh, the time to actually compute and evaluate these things, right? I mean, evaluating any of these functions, um, you know, just once is of course um, trivial, but if you have, you know, a lot of neurons, then, you know, that can become a problem, right? If you have to, um, uh, you know, keep evaluating them during the training process over and over again, then some of them, you know, really have a, you know, will cost much more time uh, than others. And so this one, for example, is you can evaluate very efficiently. So, you know, people like to use that one. 
Okay, so that's um, the simplest neural network that we can come up with. Right? It's just a linear map and an activation function. And now to build a more complex function, basically all we have to do is to include multiple neurons and then um, per layer, and then just stack um, different layers. So you can see one example here that will be now a much more um, complex function with a lot more weights and bias terms that we will have to determine. So in this particular case, we have two uh, input, uh, uh, like a, an input layer that has just two values before we have three and now we have two. Then the first hidden layer now has three neurons, right? So before we just had one, now we'll add two more. So this first uh, neuron now has two weights, right? Coming in from Xi1 and Xi2, and it has one bias term. So that one neuron has three parameters that we'll have to determine. Um, and these two, each of them also have three values, right? Two bias, two weights and one bias term. So in total, that first hidden layer has now nine parameters that we have, would have to determine. Okay, and um, <clears throat> then so the so the weights are basically associated with the, with the, um, with these um, arrows or edges here going from one layer to the next, from the input layer to the hidden layer, and then we basically continue from here. The value or the activation of this neuron will then be the input to um, the next hidden layer that you see here. So in this case, we have five neurons in in the second hidden layer, and so on, and then we get eventually all the way out. Uh, to the output layer, which is indexed here with um, L. And in this particular case, we have um, three neurons um, as the output um, of this layer. All right, so we can um, write down what this looks like. Just um, now we have to take care of a little bit more indices compared to before, right? But it's essentially the exact same thing. So this is something that, you know, you would see, say, in a textbook or um, in, in sort of introductory lectures about machine learning. Um, if we want to write down now um, the value or the, the activation for the neuron K indexed by K, so my K is one, two, three, it depends on the input to that particular layer and the weights and biases, right? And it, of course, now will depend on this activation function, which is indexed with L, meaning the activation for the last layer. Um, then it will, that activation function takes as input this expression here in brackets, meaning it depends on the weights associated with uh, the last layer L. It will depend on the values of the previous layer. So that's indexed here with L minus one, right? So it will depend on this last hidden layer, L minus one. And it will depend on the bias terms here um, that are associated with uh, the neurons in the output layer. Okay, so we'll have uh, that expression here will sum over all uh, over all um, uh, edges or arrows that we have here, right, over all the weights that are associated, say, with that neuron, N1. And we have here, of course, now three neuron neurons in the last layer, so that's why we have these additional indices K here. Okay, so there are a bunch more indices here that one sort of has to keep um, a track of, um, but it's really the exact same thing um, as in the previous layer. One just has to be careful with indices not to make a mistake. And so what we can um, Felix? Yes. Sorry, a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, actually, too. So here, the the equation that you're showing here, this is for an all-to-all -all network, right? Where you yes. have every node. So I guess, is there any use in doing networks where you don't have every node connected to every other node? Yes, there is. So um, I'll later get to convolutional neural networks. In that case, you don't have an all-to-all -all connection. Um, okay. And that can be advantageous, like by computing, if you have all-to-all -all connections, um, that requires a lot of computing time, right? Okay. Um, and so in some cases, that's not necessary. And it may be very difficult in practice to find all the parameters, right? And so in many cases, it's much more practical um, to have not an all-to-all -all connection. But then, of course, the question is, if you don't do all-to-all -all connection, like what do you do then, right? So that depends on the application. Um, but for example, what you can do if you don't have all to all connection, you know, maybe what you can do is to make this, you know, much deeper, right? That sort of deep learning, right? You have a lot of hidden layers as opposed to sort of a shallow network, right? And if you, then you probably don't want to use all to all connectivity, right? Over all these, you know, many stacked layers, right? Because that's just computationally too difficult. Right. Um, so it, it really depends on the, on the application. Okay, cool. And then my other question here is about the, the activation function. So mm -hmm. do you generally always want the same activation function for a, a given layer, or would you sometimes change activation function within a layer? Right, right. So you definitely, so it, it again depends, right? One has to sort of check, um, but there are definitely cases where you don't want to have the same 
Um, for example, like if you want your output layer right to be a positive number, right, right. Um, then you know use for example something like this, right, because that will make sure it's positive, right. You don't want to have something that's negative, right. But if right. you only use this one everywhere, right, that may not be a very good network, right. So you may want to use different layers, sort of in the hidden, sorry, different activation functions in the hidden layers, and then something that forces it to be positive. Uh, at the end, but it, it it again it really depends on you know what you're trying to do. Is it like a classification problem that you're trying to solve, a regression problem? So depending on you know your application, you definitely want to you choose different um, activation functions, okay. and that's sort of the, the art that one sort of has to learn, right? Um, to you know like go through this uh, like slowly and see what works and what doesn't, and one sort of has to develop some some intuition. Does that also kind of go along with figuring out how many hidden layers you want in your network, as opposed that, to like having that's right. you, Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Thanks. That's, that's, that's right. So like the number of hidden layers, again, it's like sort of what right, you can, again, phrase it like an optimization problem. Mm -hmm. You can, again, in principle, use machine learning to solve that optimization problem, like how many hidden layers, how many neurons, what activation function. So that goes in the context of hyperparameter optimization, right? So you basically, uh, you know, within a given class, for example, right, you want to find like the best um, set of hidden layers and the, like, you know, how many you should use and what activation functions and how many, you know, weights and bias terms and stuff. Um, and you can sort of scan that parameter space right, and find the neural network that works best um, okay. for, for your specific application. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. That's thanks. No, yeah. th th thanks a lot for the, for the questions. Are there, are there any other questions? Or is this, this clear until now? So it's, of course, um, I think one, one thing is, is very useful um, um, uh, to, to think about, uh, um, you know, how this works in detail, right? I mean, later then, you know, you're going to go to say Tensor, TensorFlow or PyTorch, right? And, and that's, these are like amazing codes, right? Like where everything's automatized and it, it just works really nicely, right? But it's really useful to like go through this in, in detail, right? And really make sure that you understand all these different aspects, right? Because every individual piece is relatively simple, but then you know you put everything together, and then it you know it, it sort of gets gets more complicated, right? And so, for example, if you then you know say you did something in TensorFlow, right, and you get some result, right, then the question is how do you improve it, right? Um, or is that already it, right? And so to answer that kind of question, it's really useful to really understand it sort of in in, in great detail. And so I'm trying to, of course, I cannot cover everything, but but you know some some aspects at least it's, it's really useful to go through it sort of in, in detail and really make sure. Uh, one understands sort of every every step uh, of, of of how this works. Okay, so in principle, uh, we can um, write down actually the entire expression here for this um, for this last output uh, a neuron n k, right? So, for example, what we can do now, this y term here, right, with index l minus one, was basically the result of these uh, neurons, right? But they are of course computed in terms of the uh, middle uh, hidden layer, right? So we can, again, insert basically this expression here um, for um, y l minus one, and that will be, sh that's shown here in, in brackets, right? Where we now basically have the weights of the layer l minus one, the bias terms l minus one. And here, um, now we have the activations or the results of the previous layer. So this is indexed by l minus two, right? So the results of l minus two, they're shown here, okay? And so that basically means we could, you know, go through all the way to the input and we could write down a closed form of what the value is or the, what the function is, right? That is um, parameterized here or that is sort of illustrated here in this picture um, of how we actually compute the neuron N1 or N2 and 3. Okay, so that's sort of the mathematical expression. And so again, here it's useful to just, you know, convince yourself that that's the correct expression and that all the indices are worked out correctly and, and, and so on. Hopefully I did not. Um, so, this. Mm -hmm. Sorry. so ideally, again, so the example that you gave at the beginning where you had the seven, you said that ideally you'd want the seven to be one and then everything else to be zero. But in reality, is this just like giving us some kind of like number between one and zero where we're getting kind of a probability of what it thinks, you know, that would be or. You know, that, that's right. That's right. That's yeah? right. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right. You would be getting, say, so it depends again on your last activation function, right? But you could map yeah. the last output, for example, to be between zero and one, where one means that that's what it is, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And zero is the probability for something else. And so it will, of course, not be exactly zero, right? That that's right. that's or it's at least unlikely, right? That you'll get something that's. I mean, it, it can be exactly zero, right? Because like some of the activation functions set it exactly to zero, right? Mm -hmm. um, but usually you'll get something that's like just very small, and then from there you can then um, you know 
depending on how you set it up, right? If, if one of them has a very large value, you can take like an argmax function or something like that to then you know, fix that the, the answer of the neural network is this. Um, usually you then classify or quantify, I should say, the, the, um, uh, the uh, performance of a classifier in terms, terms of broad curves. And you basically introduce a decision threshold of wh when you sort of gonna call something a one and when you, sorry, when are you gonna call something a seven and when you're gonna call something a six or something like that, right? Okay. Um, so so that's, that's called receiver operator curves or rock curves. Uh, and I'll get back to those later, specifically for binary classifications where we only have two classes. Um, so that, okay. that's basically how you would you know, quantify how well it works. And then if you wanna deploy the model, right, then you just pick a threshold that works well for you. Um, and, and sort of depending on the application again, right? right. So I'll, I'll get back to those things uh, a, a little bit later. Um, now, looking at the time, um, I see it's, uh, I think it's already past, just past the hour. Um, I don't know, Raul, can I still talk a little bit more or should I? Yeah, we have two hours reserved, so it's up to you. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Then maybe let me finish like this section on your networks, and then we'll do the rest on on, on Thursday. Okay, sounds good. Sounds, sounds good. good. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so and of course, if if there are any other questions, um, let me let me know. Um, and otherwise, we'll continue to discuss how we're actually going to train the neural network now. So. The question now is, now we understand how that neural network looks like, right? But I can write down the function, right? So we have basically a translation from these you know, images um, or representations of neural networks to a mathematical equation, right? That's, that's, that's this, right? And so if you have some computer code, right? Then that basically implements this you know, with TensorFlow or, or, or whatever, right? It just efficiently implements that. Um, but of course, now we have basically a function that you know maps input to output that is parameterized in a lot of with a lot of parameters, right? With weights and biases, right? And the question is, how do we determine all those different parameters? Um, and of course, you can imagine that 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 can be like a big issue, right? And that's actually been been sort of historically the problem with neural networks, right? That it just introduces so many parameters, and we would have to scan this gigantic parameter space. Um, and for a long time, we just didn't have the computational tools to actually do that, right? Because it just uh, requires, for example, things like GPUs and so on to be used efficiently, right? And or to, to or just to be used in general, um, to actually do that in in, in um, sort of in practice, right? For 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 things like you know image recognition, so that there really has been a problem. So the question is, how how can we find all those different parameters? And that's sort of really at the heart of machine learning, right? To like try to find um, like all these different um, um, you know parameters that describe uh, uh, and, and do the things that 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 we want, right? And so. So what I'll talk about here is um, <clears throat> that I mentioned before is supervised learning. Um, one can, you know, there's other ways of doing this, um, but um, that's sort of um, maybe the, the simplest case. Well, I don't know if it's the simplest case, but it's what we'll do here, um, where we have data and we have labels associated with it. So here, um, that's not nuclear physics, but it's again, this sort of simple example of, of hand-drawn uh, uh, images of, of numbers. Um, where say, you know, this is a five, zero, four, one, nine, and so on. So that's going to be the input. And we want, you know, we need to have labels for that, right? And of course, we can just see the labels, right? And that's, it's very simple, right? Like this is a five, zero, four, one, nine, right? So that's something we can see very easily, but it can be difficult for, for, the, for the neural network, right? And so that, that'll be the labels, right? So what do you see here? That's the images, right? So that will be um, the data. Um, and it's supervised because we also tell it what the labels are, right? So we have 10 labels going from zero to nine, okay? And we want to train a neural network that can do that classification for us, okay? All right, so the question is how do we do that? And so um, the tools that, as it turns out, are able to scale to really, really large neural networks um, are called backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent. And so I'll try to discuss those again in, 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 in some detail and again, go through the math for a very, very simple neural network. Um, but it again, generalizes to larger neural networks as well. Um, the only difference is gonna be that we'll have to keep track of a lot more indices. Um, and so here I'll just remove the indices to make it very, very simple. Um, <clears throat> but it really, like it, it, it basically, you know, has sort of all the problems that you would have for a larger network uh, as well. Okay. So the network we'll look at is shown here. Um, 
<coughs> sorry, it's a very simple neural network. Um, there's basically just one neuron um, per layer. Right? So we have input layer, one neuron, two hidden layers, each one neuron, and then we have one output neuron. Um, so the parameters that we have here, uh, the set of parameters that we have is of course also very small. Like every neuron just has one connection to the previous one, meaning this one has one weight, one bias term, right? Very simple. So that's uh, W3, B3. Uh, and this one again has a bias and weight, bias and weight, and that's it, right? So we have six parameters. So it's very, very simple. Um, and so we'll basically just look at also first, just the output neuron. And, and, and from there, that's basically where we'll then compute the cost function, okay? So the goal is that, you know, whatever input we have, maps to some output and that output has to better match um, the label that we associate with it, right? So if we think of it, say, as binary classification, right? I have, say, I wanna say, you know, not classify these 10 numbers, but I wanna classify just, um, I don't know, say zero or one, right? Then whenever I feed in a one into that neural network, then it has to produce me the label one. If I feed in a zero, an image of a zero, it has to produce the label zero, okay? And so the way we now compute how good the net neural network is at this point is uh, we look at the value or the, you know, the activation um, of this last um, output neuron here, okay? And we compare how close is that to the label that we would like it to produce, okay? And that's the cost function. So that's um, shown here or the loss function. So here, this is um, a, a call C0 uh, with index zero. Um, which is just given uh, by the value of the activation of this last neuron here. We, we, like, we call this A with superscript L, right? So, so we, again, the last layer, this L minus one, L minus two, L minus three. And we compare that to um, the output label, which we call here Y, okay? So that would basically be the, the labels that I had here, right? So the zero, one, two, three, like not the images, but the actual labels, right? And we'll, we'll square that to just make sure everything's positive, right? So that's our cost function, or it's one example of a cost function. There's, again, there are always different ways to do things, but that's one way of doing it. Um, we have the value of the neural network at the end of that particular neuron. We compare it um, to the desired output label that it should be um, uh, producing, right? And so if it's, if it's perfect, right, then that AL and Y would just be the same. So the cost would be zero, right? So that, like if we train it perfectly, right, that's what it'd be doing. Um, in practice, of course, not going to do that, um, especially if we initialize it with sort of random numbers um, for the weights and biases. If we start our training, um, that's basically in the initialization, right? This will give some finite value um, for C0. And then what we'll have to do is we have to minimize that, okay? Um, the way we minimize it, and I'll say a bit more on the next slide about this, is through stochastic gradient descent. So you can think of it basically as... Um, like a landscape in you know, the, the parameter space. So in this case, six parameters, and you sort of want to vary all of them, right? And, and um, you want to find the minimum in sort of this manifold, right? So you have, we have like a you know, landscape and you want to find the minimum. And the way you do that is you find the gradient, you follow the gradient and you subsequently update uh, your weights and bias terms until you get to that minimum, okay? And so what we'll need to know to do that is how the cost function here changes as I change, for example, um, say this weight W3, right? So I need to know if I you know, change that a little bit, how does it affect my cost, right? So I need to know how the cost function changes as I change my weights and biases. And that change, um, that's gonna be part of my gradient vector. And that tells me which direction I have to make the next step. And then I you know, keep updating it, okay? And so the way, or a, a very efficient way uh, to, to do that um, is through what is called backpropagation. Um, and that's basically making use of the, of the chain rule. So let's introduce a little bit more notation here. Um, so we compute the cost function here as the difference between AL and Y. Um, then AL, of course, we know how to compute right from the previous slide. That's the activation function here. Here it's now called sigma before we called it phi, sorry <laughs> for that change, but it's the same thing. And uh, we evaluate um, that um, at ZL, where ZL is given um, as the weight of the last layer times um, the activation of the previous layer, right? Um, plus a bias term, right? So here's no sum or anything because it's just, you know, the string basically. Um, so there's no sum here. We just have the activation times weight, bias term, and then we take that as input uh, to compute 
uh, uh, the active, you know, the activation of the last uh, uh, neuron, which goes into the cost function. Okay, so these these three steps, um, and so it's, it looks like it's like making it a little bit more complicated, but um, like hopefully later we'll be clear why 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 we do that. Uh, to, you know, sort of take this apart a little bit, right? Because of course, what I could do is I can just write everything in here. Right? I can substitute the a here and then the z here, but uh, we'll just keep that structure for now because. Um, you know, that will later help us to also compute other things, okay? So what, what we now want to know is how does the cost function change if I change my weight W3, okay? And so I can compute that with um, the chain rule, all right? So what I want to, want to do or what I want to know is the change of the cost function C0 with the last weight, so the WL, which in this case is W3, okay? And... Um, we can compute that and using the chain rule um, by first looking at the change of C naught with AL, right? So how does C change? Because that's you know where the W will be contained in, so somewhere in the A function. So we'll first uh, take that derivative of C naught, then we look at the change of A with Z, and then we look at the change of Z with W. Okay, so um, like in this case, right, you can just basically cross these things out, right? And you see that you know, the left and right side of the equation are, are the same. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so that what that tells us, right, is how the cost function changes with respect to the last weight W3. So, well, what is the answer to that? Um, we can just, you know, compute those derivatives. Um, so we look at the change of C0 with A, right? If I take the derivative of this, I get down to two and then the, the bracket, right? So uh, the terms are bracket. So that's what's shown here on the right. Then um, we, of course, want to make this general, right? We don't want to uh, like assume a particular form of the activation function. Um, so we'll just leave the sigma as whatever it is, right? So we'll take here sigma prime. So the first derivative uh, with respect to um, z. Uh, and then, um, the, so that'll be the middle term. And the first term will be just taking the derivative um, of z with respect to uh, w, right? So that will just give us the l, uh, the a uh, l minus one term, okay? Um, so what that sort of allows us to do now, because we wrote it sort of in this complicated form, is that we have here a product of three different terms, okay? So if I want to know the change of the cost function with respect to the last weight, W3, then um, I just have to multiply these three terms, okay? And so that basically now tells us immediately right, what I would have to do if I want to know the change of the cost function with respect to, um, say, the weight W2, right? All I really have to do is I take again what this is, and then I multiply three more terms, basically, right? Um, because I basically have to go, I now have to look at how does this function change with W, right? Or how does the cost function change with W2? That will give me the exact same terms as here, and now I just have to replace this, or I have to continue taking the derivative of this activation here with respect to W2, okay? And so that's, that's what is called backpropagation, right? Like here we did it just for the very, first, the very last neuron, but by basically just adding, keeping to just add multiple, more and more factors, right? We can go all the way back um, to basically at the very beginning of the neural network, okay? And so we just keep adding or, or you know, keep including uh, uh, factors in, in this product. And so, and then of course, also if we have multiple layers, right, we just have to basically follow and that's sort of where this back propagation comes in uh, or that the name comes from that we sort of go uh, in the opposite direction to these arrows that we had before and sort of follow um, the gradient and we're very efficiently able to uh, compute that. Okay, so that's, that's, that's back propagation. Um, and so then what we need to do, um, what that right, generally tells us, right, we now know how the cost function changes with respect to one of the parameters. Um, then that would allow us to look at this uh, landscape of the parameters, right? So what we're plotting here is basically the cost function as a function in this case of two parameters, right? So here's like a, some, say uh, like weight one and weight two, and then we have, you know, this landscape. In practice, of course, that's gonna be a multi-dimensional landscape, right? That will not be able to visualize so easily, but then uh, we'll basically follow here uh, the gradient uh, so we say at this point here, the gradient allows us, you know, toward tells us where the steepest descent is, and then we'll basically go down here on um, the steepest descent, and we'll hopefully eventually find the minimum that is say, you know, here here in this case. Okay. Um, there's one more um, thing that I wanted to mention, um, which is that we'll be using uh, what is called stochastic gradient descent, meaning we don't actually compute the gradient as it's shown here. So that's really the absolute gradient, right? If I take the entire data set and I compute a gigantic gradient vector. 
um, that would be computationally quite difficult. But what we can do instead, we'll just take a you know, smaller sample of the data, right? So as opposed to, you know, if this were like a large data set, right, then we'll just use the first row, for example, right? And we compute the gradient of just that first row, just of the first set of images, right? And that will not necessarily point directly um, in sort of the absolute gradient, but it will more or less point in that, right? And then we keep rotating through the, what is you know, that's called the mini batch, right? We keep rotating through the entire data set. And then on average, that's sort of what makes it stochastic, right? We'll eventually also end up here, but computationally, um, that's more efficient and it's more tractable if you have really a large uh, a parameter space, okay? So that allows us to optimize the cost function. And so these, these two, two components, like the back propagation and the stochastic gradient descent, um, that's basically the main tools that work for the simple network, right, that we looked at here. We use the chain rule and everything looks very nice. Um, but that is what is implemented in uh, TensorFlow and, and all these other um, programs, right? And it turns out with, you know, maybe some small modifications here and there to optimize things that really also works for really, really large uh, neural networks as well. And so that's, that's really sort of the exciting part of, of, of machine learning, right? Like here, say we had I don't know, maybe 50 parameters, right? And then we'll be able to do that. Um, but the interesting thing is, and, and that's really sort of, I would say at the heart of machine learning, right, is that, um, this also works if you have a billion parameters um, in more or less the same way. Of course, this will eventually get computationally expensive, um, but it's still tractable uh, with the computational tools um, that we have available, or at least I'd say, you know, companies like Google have available and you know, the things we can do for nuclear physics we also have pretty good computers. Um, then we're actually able to you know, scan this gigantic parameter space and anyway, um, be able to optimize and sort of find the minimum in, uh, in, in, in this landscape, in this, uh, you know, the cost function. Um, so one sort of impressive example are, you know, what, what people discuss a lot these days, which are called foundational models, right? They have, you know, order a billion parameters and it anyway works, right? And so that's sort of the, 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 the fascinating thing, right? That even though there's a gigantic number of um, parameters, we can anyway do it with these relatively simple tools, right? That we can understand here in this, you know, kind of trivial network, right? That, that we looked at here, but it does generalize and it does um, uh, scale up to really, really large uh, neural networks. And that's really what enables all these applications from, you know, self-driving cars and image recognition. And, um, you know, also what we'll discuss here, you know, looking at jets and, and um, uh, trying to find, um, uh, you know, new particles and, and identify quark and gluon jets and things like that. So maybe let me step here, stop here for a moment. Are there any questions about this? I hope the notation and so on with the indices was not too confusing. I tried to reduce as many indices as possible. Um, so maybe let me know if that was kind of clear or uh, if there are any questions. Yeah, I think I have one question. Can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's taking a second. There we go, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So this this A is essentially the value of, of a given neuron, AL. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Right. So, so then, it's, right. So AL is basically the value of, of the last neuron. Mm -hmm. AL minus one is the previous one. And so you just keep you know indexing from the end backward. Okay. And so that's just a particular choice. Mm -hmm. Generally, we get the value of this by computing, you know, this the ZL and then passing it into this activation function. But in the case where our L equals one in this case, and we're going back to our input layer, do we just substitute the value of the input in that case? Or is there something special that we need to do for this, you know, the A0 piece, I guess? So, so you only need to know how it changes with respect to the weights, right? So the input is not, not a parameter that you would change, right? Um, so, so you, right, like you, like the input is fixed, right? That's basically this is the input, right? And you know, the label. So, right in supervised training, right, your input is fixed and it has a, an associated label. Mm -hmm. um, what we want to know is how the cost changes with respect to the weights and biases, right? So, we'll basically follow the chain rule, the back propagation, until we reach, you know, the the W one and B one. So they are associated uh, with like the double. So the B one is associated with that neuron of the hidden layer. Uh, and the weight is associated with that edge or that arrow here of, of that, you know, between these two units. This one here is input, right? We're not changing the input. Right. But if you, so like, if you want to do this for W1, mm -hmm. right? So then the W1 depends on what we're labeling as A0. 
right? If right, you, right, right. Right. And so in that right. case, the A0 is just the value of the input. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Right. That, okay. Right, cool. right, right, right. So so this so so that so the data basically goes in um through you know whatever uh, yeah, what you know, whatever that neuron is, right? And mm -hmm. the label, right? Like so, so the input, um so so the data goes or like the, the label data, right, goes in both two ways, right? In into the cost function, it enters here as the label y, and it enters here as input to the first neuron, right? Mm -hmm. And that determines basically, right? Like if, if you train on different images, right, you'll get a different cost function, right? So um that will give a different profile, right? Um, that you need to optimize and find the minimum. So um Right, I, I hope that kind of makes it clear, right? So the, yep. that like it, it contributes to the cost function, um, and you know if you whatever you train on, right, that will give you a different cost function, a different profile. Um, but it's not something you would optimize for. You want to um, you know change the weights and biases. And, and exactly. Like, yep. Hmm? yep. Right, right, right. That's right. That's a that's a good point. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any on the chat. Um, people are welcome to speak up and ask their questions. If not, you know how to find Felix, which is oh, which is either the Slack channel or here Thursday again. So, so I see a question from Jose. Saying theoretically, it can be argued that the standard model should contain a term that breaks CP symmetry, relating matter and antimatter, matter, and a strong interacting set. Experimentally, however, no such violation has been found yet. Therefore, with more accurate neural networks, do you think it would be possible to find a solution to the problem? Uh, maybe, do you mean theoretically or experimentally? I imagine he means experimentally. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I guess it depends on exactly what it was, what was it, like how the question is meant. I mean, w w one way one can, you know, try to find these things is through anomaly detection, right? Um, so probably not just able to be, to be discussed, uh, to discuss this in, in, in detail, but um, what you can do with machine learning is to look for outliers, right? Um, and so that would be one way, right? We just look at the data without, you know, a lot of constraints, right? And and you just see, is there something that doesn't look right, right? So that's that's one way, right? So if you can optimize that very well, that's actually, you know, uh, like a research direction where people are still trying to make progress. Um, sometimes not really working quite the way we would hope uh, for the data, right, that, that we get uh, in, in these collider experiments. Um, but that's one way, but right? if you can optimize this better, right, that would give us, you know, potentially an indication of, you know, where to look for, basically, right. So that that would be one one way to sort of look for these extensions of uh, beyond standard model physics. So I don't know if that answers exactly the question, but I sort of, you know, the thing I would um, think about here, and, or as, as one way, you know, how that that can be useful for for searches. At least, at least in uh, in accelerator experiments. Right. Mm -hmm. That would that's be right. that's like a reasonable one. Right, right. I mean, like like another way, of course, you know, which I'll probably also not discuss in too much detail is, but you can, you know, use it to to get better predictions, right, from QCD, right? So we know that we know QCD, right? And so sometimes computation is very difficult to do that, right? And you can use machine learning to get very, very precise predictions. We hope that we can do that, right? Um, and so potentially also in this direction, right? If, if you're better able to solve QCD, right, um, then that can also give us a better prediction for the background for what we know for the standard model, right? And then we can compare that to data and see if there are deviations, right? That would be another way how uh, machine learning can, can help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we certainly need a lot of help. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Great, do we see, are there any other questions out there? That last one was a good one. Not to say the other ones weren't good. They've all been excellent. All right. Let me let me see. Right. I still had uh, three three slides for this. So should I should I go through those and then the rest will be for Thursday? How about how about that? <laughs> 
Sure. Yeah. You're in charge. All right. All right. Okay. So um, the last part I wanted to discuss here in this context of neural networks is convolutional neural networks. And so from there, we'll then, you know, go on Thursday back to, you know, nuclear physics. <clears throat> so what are convolutional neural networks and why, why are they, they, they interesting? Um, so well, what I discussed in the previous slides, and which was also mentioned by one of you, um, was these fully connected neural, neural networks, right, where we have layers of neurons and we connect them all to the next layer and so on. And so one of the issues is that it's computationally difficult and they may be not perfectly suited to identify patterns and correlations in images. And so a convolutional neural network um, is designed to better make use of those um, techniques, okay, or, or of these aspects, right? So what, what, what do I mean by that? Well, a pattern or a correlation um, could be something like an edge in an image or a circle. Um, so for example, if you look at this image over here, right, you can see there's like an edge between kind of the green background and like the ear of the cat, right? So that's like a straight line, that's, that's some edge, right? And so um, if I just would feed that entire image through a neural network, right, it couldn't sort of make use of these local, this local information, right? That, that there is clearly something that's, you know, be, be, like before the you know, green background, right? And so a convolutional neural network can make use of that because it makes, uh, looks basically at certain patches in the image at a time, uh, which what is called a filter. And then it just moves that filter through the image and looks for different patches uh, or correlations and patterns in that image. Um, and then you basically iterate that system again. So the first layer maybe will make use of very basic features like edges or circles. The you know, higher hidden layers that are following sort of the first and the second one, maybe they'll make use and identify something like an eye or so, right? Maybe it will identify something like, you know, the eye of the cat or so, right? And it will maybe see that there's differences, you know, in the eye of a cat and the eye of a dog, right? So that, you know, maybe would be sort of a higher level, right? Um, or if we have, you know, like a, like an image, like the one shown here that where they're like different animals, right? Then like a very high level, uh, uh, level of the, the convolutional neural network could just identify like this looks kind of like a cat and a dog. So we basically have sort of different levels of abstraction, right? So either it looks for edges, circles, uh, eyes, or eventually the entire animal, right? Um, and so the convolutional neural network, again, is built out of simple uh, uh, building blocks. And well, that's so-called convolutional layers that are built with filters. And then there are also so-called pooling layers where you basically look at a patch and you identify it. So what's the maximum value, right? So what sticks out. Uh, and that also allows you to downsample, right? You start with the image and you need to, you know, eventually get to zero and one, right? You need to end up with two neurons. So that's also a way to, to reduce basically dimensionality of the problem. Um, so one of the interesting things is it makes use of patterns uh, and it requires less parameters than a fully connected neural network. And so what that allows us to do is to construct much deep, deeper networks. And so, for example, if you have, you know, very detailed features that we want to make use of uh, or that we have in our images, um, then um, that's very well suited uh, to do that. But it's really still the exact same um, strategy as before. It's basically just a somewhat different architecture of sort of this basic neural network that is fully connected that I talked about before. And so... Uh, let me show you um, sort of the most important building block, um, a convolutional layer that is um, shown here. So on the very left, we have the input image. And so as I mentioned, when an image, um, say if you just have a grayscale image, um, then uh, we basically just look at the intensity, right? Like which is quantified as in this case with values between zero and nine, right? Well, that just gives us the intensity um, of say a grayscale image. If I have colors, right, then I would have red, green, and blue. Um, but let's just think of it as a, as a grayscale image. And I have, you know, some values in here. All right. So then what the convolutional layer does, it applies a filter. Um, and then we get here to what, what I call the output layer or um, the, the hidden layer. And so the way it operates is that it applies this filter that is shown here in the middle, um, which itself has some numbers. And that's basically the weights that we eventually want to optimize. And so it basically just projects this onto this patch, this three by three patch in the original image. 
uh, in the square, and it just multiplies these numbers together. So it computes what is called the dot product. Okay, and that's what's shown here. So it basically multiplies the nine with a zero, it multiplies the four with a two, and so on, and then it adds up everything, right? Um, and it apparently gives it 60, okay? And so it's, called, it's basically like a dot product because it, um, um, if you were to take two vectors, right, and you uh, multiply them together and you sum over everything like that, that would kind of be the same thing, right? Um, and then that would give us here the first number um, 16, okay, by applying this filter, okay? And so like the way, right, if, if there's a particular pattern here, right, in, in this part or in this patch of the image, right, and we eventually optimize these weights here, um, then it will give us a very high or very low score, right? Whether that, for example, is an image, uh, sorry, whether that is, for example, an edge or not, right? Um, and so, but it's making use of sort of locally of, you know, the surrounding area, right? It looks at the one in the center and it looks sort of at the neighbors around it and it sees if there's any interesting correlation or pattern that it can potentially make use of, right? And so that's different than um, like the, the neural networks, the, the sort of the regular uh, feed forward neural networks, they would just basically take all of that, right? And feed it to the next layer, right? The entire image. And so it's much more difficult to sort of make use of local patterns. And so this can be done much more efficiently this way. Now there's still a bunch of empty boxes here. And so what you then do is you move the filter over, right? And move it sort of one over, right? And you look at this three by three patch uh, of, of the image here and you compute the same thing again. So it's basically looking, is there again, some kind of edge feature or so in that part of, of, of the image, right? And then that will give you a number here and then you move it over one more and then you move it down, you know, and that's basically how you fill in all these uh, missing numbers here. Okay, so it's basically trying to make use of this, this local uh, information. And then you basically proceed in the exact same way um, as before, right? You add several hidden layers and you um, basically <clears throat> um, add, you know, for each hidden layer, you add basically several filters, okay? So that's what's sh um, shown in this illustration here. We have um, uh, an image that we start with. Um, we look at, um, you know, filter, say, is of this size um, that is shown here in yellow. And we just basically slide it up and down, you know, through um, this image. And for every, you know, uh, 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 patch that, that we're computing the stock product, that will give us a value here in this uh, next hidden layer. Okay. And then you see here four of these, right? Um, say we start here, this is 36 times 36 pixels, right? This has 28 by 28. So it's a little bit less, right? Because it's a relatively large filter and gives us one. Um, and because of, you know, the finite size of this, uh, it, it reduces the image size in this case. Um, otherwise one you know, could zero pad it and stuff like that. Um, and then it basically does that for four different filters, right? Like one filter gives the first one, and then we have three other filters. And all of those again, contain weights that are gonna be trainable. Um, and then we sort of get these, fear, these four uh, um, in, in this first hidden layer. Then there's a max pooling layer that basically means now this is not a convolutional filter, but it basically just picks up the maximum uh, value in that patch and it maps it to here. And then you basically just continue. Right? And so in the end, you have then you know, four, uh, four um, final layers and that, that would be the output, okay? <clears throat> and that could again be, for example, for a classification problem, right? If you start with images of say cats, dogs, birds, and, and uh, no, mice, right? Then you could use the scores that you obtain here or you know, the activations of these last four neurons to um, design a classifier and try to you know, identify what kind of image it is, right? And so it just turns out that that's um, been extremely successful using these convolutional neural networks. And so, um, you know, the first try, right, would be to just, can we use that to identify uh, jets that originate from quarks and gluons or from the Higgs particle, right? And so uh, that's what we'll discuss uh, uh, on Thursday and two days from now, right? Can we, um, you know, use those type of techniques uh, that were developed here specifically in computer vision and so on, right? Can we use that one-to-one uh, -one, uh, in nuclear physics? And, you know, the answer, um, will be kind of, right? It, it does work, um, but one can also do better. So, um, but there's certainly this very interesting interplay right, between uh, computer science and things um, that we're interested in, in nuclear and particle physics. And so um, I think that's a good um, point to stop here and then uh, we'll continue.
to answer that question uh, on, on Thursday. Um, and of course, now please still let me, let me know if there are any questions about convolutional neural networks or about anything else that I uh, discussed today. All right, do people have any questions? About anything under the sun related to what Felix talked about today? Yeah, I have a quick question about this picture just to make sure I understand kind of what you were explaining. So I get that we have this, this first image here that's 36 by 36, and we're essentially applying this filter to it. Um, and so then we have these, you know, four squares next to it. So would we consider each one of these like four blue squares as a neuron in the first hidden layer? And each, you know, filter is kind of, you know, defining which, you know, information from this input is going to each neuron as opposed to having the all to all. So I mean, so I, I'm not quite sure what's like the right best way to sort of make the connection to the previous one. It's, it's just a little bit different the way you think about it. Right? Okay. It's like, um, right, you could think sort of as each individual pixel here as a neuron, right? That would be one way to do it, right? Or, mm -hmm. but, but that of course would also be a little stranger. So maybe it's just better to think of it as sort of four uh, feature maps or like four, okay. you apply the, you know, the, yeah, I guess feature maps is the right word. Let's <laughs> say uh, you apply basically the filter by right? like four different. So four different filters are applied, right? Mm -hmm. And so you just move it over with, you know, either you know one pixel at a time, or you can also have a larger stride. So you move over two or three pixels at a time, and that will generate you just a, a new image. Um, and it, it basically just means like if you have four, that just means we apply four different filters, right? And mm -hmm. each filter has. It, its own weights, right? So if this is like a nine by nine, then this has at least, you know, nine by nine uh, parameters for mm -hmm. the first one and the other three, um, you know, depend on a different filter. Each of those has its own nine by nine uh, uh, parameters, right? That, that we can then um, optimize over, right? So, right, so, so you do again, basically, right, the same thing as before, right? You can do a, um, a, a back propagation, um, you wanna know, how you know sensitive is the cost function here on the very right to some parameter that I have here in my filter, right? And I want to know, you know, which direction I should, you know, move uh, to do the, the stochastic gradient descent, right? And so in that sense, it's 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 very similar, but it's sort of a little different architecture of how to how to think of it. Um, All right. If that if that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. And then here within hidden layer one, are we applying a filter again to go from the twenty eight by twenty eight to the fourteen by fourteen? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. So, so except that this is this is so there's these two layers, right? That are used like the convolutional and the max pooling layers. So there's um, again, this is just something that people found to work very well. Um, mm -hmm. So you use um, then kind of inter well, in this case they use interchange interchangeably. So you start with the convolutional layer and then you use max pooling and then you go back to convolution. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the max pooling here is like it again uses a filter, um, <clears throat> but it's in that case you basically. Um, so, so you have to specify the size basically, um, but it basically just picks out the pixel um, or, or it takes the value of the, the pixel with the largest uh, intensity. Um, there's also different ways to do this. Um, like sometimes, um, you know, use exactly the max function to do that. Sometimes you use a slightly different things. Um, so there's different ways how can, you know, how one can sort of tweak things and one can, you know, try to, you know, optimize for how exactly to set it up. Um, but this is sort of a, a, a different layer. Um, the, the main, I don't know, I guess the intuition is that again, you want to, um, um, that, that you sort of want to see what really stands out, you know, like what, what um, aspect is most important uh, uh, in, in sort of classifying, you know, this image, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that's why you sort of use this as an intermediate uh, layer and you don't have only convolutional layers um, okay. that usually just, you know, turns out to work very well. Right. Um, but it's, I, I would say sort of the, the, the main aspect is that in both cases, you're looking at sort of like a, you know, this, you know, something kind of local, right. Um, you know, in sort of, you know, the pixel at the center and it's sort of surrounding neighbors, right. Like, so if you make it local to sort of find patterns in sort of a patch of, of, of your image, as opposed to, you know, looking at the entire thing at once, um, 
And so, so what, one, one thing that people do, and I kind of skipped here, is that if you then, right, later you can go back, right, and you can look at, um, like, once you optimize your weights, right, and you can look at the filters, right, themselves, um, you can also basically plot their intensity, right? Um, and so you can look at what these filters actually look like. And so often the first filters here, right, they basically um, look right, like the, um, the, the values in these filters, right? If you just take those as intensities, um, mm -hmm. then they, for example, look for edges or circles and stuff like that, right? So if you then, you know, after training, you go back, right? Then you see that these early um, filters here look for specific, um, you know, edges or, or circles. And the later ones look for more, you know, um, sort of sophisticated patterns like an eye or some or a ear or something like that, right. because you okay. basically, you know, have sort of different levels of abstraction, um, and, and, uh, right? So that that's sort of, you know, after training, you can sort of go back and and, and look at this. Right. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, maybe if there's no other questions. Um, maybe it's a good time to stop. I mean, you're going to pick things up on Thursday. So, you know, people come up with more questions. In the meantime, you're welcome to put them on the Slack chat or just save them for the live session on Thursday. Um, so that seems like a good play, like a good policy. So maybe just stop right there. Um, thanks again, Felix, for making time out of your busy schedule to come and lecture to us about this i mean i've certainly learned something so i'm sure many other have others have as well and just to remind you um so felix will talk again on thursday august the 4th at 11 a.m eastern time in the u.s so uh, we'll see you there and if you're part of the mentoring program uh, just a reminder that in an hour and 15 minutes we'll have uh, our social get together so make sure to join that and you know it should be fun uh, and so i'll see you there if i don't see you before then all right uh thanks felix take care everybody see you guys later all right. thanks and see you on thursday bye, bye.